Church, you guys are uh, you guys are cheaters. <laughs> the folks that were here at the at the 9:30, man, they they felt they felt that that spring forward uh, effect, and um, man, it's so so good to be in the house of the Lord uh, with all of you guys. Plus, uh, it's the weather's uh, turning out uh, towards our favor. Did you guys see the next like forecast? Seven days, jeez, three consecutive days in 68. Come on, Jesus is coming soon, my brothers and sisters. I feel the heat. <laughs> all right, hey, well, if you're new or visiting us, we're a family. My name is Alex. I get to serve here as one of the pastors on behalf of our entire Anthem family. It's our honor that you chose to be here this morning. I know that it, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it feels awkward to just show up to a new space. And so thank you for being brave. Um, we would love to connect with you after service. We are currently going through a sermon collection titled The Apostles' Creed. And uh, the, the really the heart behind this series is for us to be rooted and grounded in the, the non-negotiable tenets of our faith. I mean, these are the, uh, this, these are the boundaries the bumpers, if you will, uh, of Christianity, the, the closed-hand issues that we must all agree on in order for us to, to coexist. And so uh, we have been doing what uh, the church has been doing, using the, the creeds to correct false beliefs and then to form us into the right beliefs so that we would live out these beliefs in our lives. And so I want to invite you guys, if you're willing and able, to stand on your feet. We're going to read the creed together. You guys ready? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe. the word, let it be so. Uh, we are today out of sync a little bit. We're supposed to be talking about the Catholic Church, and I just figure you're not ready for that. And so uh, we're, we're going to jump into the communion of the saints. Next week, I have a pastor coming uh, that is not part of this local body, and he's going to be demonstrating that we are in this together as a church, capital church. Uh, today, uh, I want to read two passages, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, and then Hebrews 10. I, <laughs> I believe I'm a believer. <clears throat> See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is, as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we, if we indeed hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, God, that it is a light unto our path, a light unto our feet, Lord. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's someone that's something that corrects our false beliefs and forms us into the people that we ought to be. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do just that, form us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You guys are welcome to take a seat. <clears throat> Up to today, up to this point, we have been looking at uh, we have been looking at the triune nature of God: God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So we've been looking at the vertical uh, implications of community, and today uh, we're going to look at how that affects us here horizontally. How does that affect me and you today as a community? Uh, in order for us to understand true community, we have to understand that we were made in God's image. And God is a communal God, right? They are one. 
They're committed. They're in a covenant together. God is for God, meaning that the Father is for the Son and the Spirit. The Spirit's for the Son and the Father. The Son is for the Spirit and the Father. They are for one, and therefore, they are in beautiful, uh, eternal community. In Anthem Church, we were created. We were created to be in this community. We were created to reflect this community, not just be in this community, but to reflect this community. Um, I want to address some false beliefs that we have to uh, keep in mind as I progress through the sermon. Uh, number one false belief is that I don't need a, I, I don't need to be in a covenant community. I don't need to be a member of a covenant community. I could be a fluent attender. I could show up if I want. If I'm in town, if my schedule's not busy, I will participate in life groups or the Sunday gathering. Serving in the church is not for everyone. It's for the young, the gifted, for those that have time or those that have money. Corporate singing is for silly extroverts like Pastor Alex. It's not for me because I'm a serious intellectual person. I'm a man. And so those are some false beliefs. And so I, I just began with uh, the theology of the triune nature of God and how we are are made in his image, right? In order for us to truly reflect the image of God, we have to live out, we have to experience, embody such community, covenantal community, everlasting community. We have to be part of that. That's just what we are invited to. Someone once said that we do not exist until we are known. We do not exist until we are known. And known is the idea of being seen, being heard and being uh, uh, loved, where someone is practically sacrificing themselves on your behalf. They are doing what is good for you. So we do not exist until someone is present in our life, really present, not on their phone, but really present, really, really hears us. It's not just listening to respond to us, but is listening to understand us. And then at the same time, someone that really, really cares about, about us, that is asking us, how are you doing? How can I help you? We do not exist until that reality becomes ours. That's how God created us. Now, it's to be known. It, uh, when we talk about being known, we're talking about the true self, not the projected self. Right? Not the self that we want people to, to, to believe that we are, but the true self, the want, the thoughts, the intentions that no one else sees and no one else knows, but you know. But you know, that is the self that is, is created to be known. And we do not exist until the true self is known. God said it's not good for man to be alone. It's just not good. C.S. Lewis gave an address years ago called the inner ring. And in that address, he said the following, one of the great ground motives, one of the great driving motivations of the human heart is that it has an obsessive desire to be in the inner ring. An obsessive desire to be in the inner ring where we are known. We, we find ourselves part of groups, right, existing groups. And you go on social media, and man, social media just really just uh, doesn't help us in this regard. We go on social media and we see someone is having a, some kind of gathering at their house after church. And uh, all your friends are there except you, right? <laughs> you thought you were in the inner circle and then you quickly realized you're not there. And so how does that make you feel? It doesn't make you feel good, right? Even though you already have plans and you have people at your house. It's just the way we were created. We have this deep longing to, to just be in the circles. You are perhaps making some money now. And you have friends around you. You're in a really, life, a really solid life group. But man, you just don't feel weight. You don't feel glory. You feel like there's something missing. You're lacking. Why? Because there is a group. There is a really affluential group, wealthy people that are making certain figures. And they're together. They get to meet once a week together. But you're not invited. 
I'm a hard worker. I have money. Look at my savings. Look what I accomplished, right? Why am I not in that group? And so there's this obsession to be in that group, and we're willing to even pay money for it. We, we are willing not to say things that we want to say, and we're willing to, uh, we're willing to say things that we typically wouldn't say. As long as we could be in that group, we're willing to be hypocrites just to fit in. It's our desire. Uh, C.S. Lewis continues on, and he says, when you get into this inner circle, the initial rush always, that initial excitement, that rush of like being in, it always wears off. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. And so what happens is sooner or later, you're on the hunt for the next inner circle. You're on the hunt for the next inner circle. And so the quest for this inner ring must be broken. It must be broken. We must break it. We must break its hold over us uh, or else it will break us. It will break our soul. It'll ruin us. It'll ruin your kids. And so where do we get this idea that it breaks the soul? Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, they are in the inner circle. They are with the triune God. God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But there is another circle. Satan comes and he says, hey, this circle, you could be just like God. You're, you could be free. You could be, you could be independent. You could be autonomous. This, is, this, this life's about you. You don't have to be for God. You could be for yourself. And so Adam and Eve, they're seduced. They're lured in by their own desires, lured into this inner circle that is not the circle of the triune God. And what happens? They are in a spiral free fall of pursuing that next circle. Humanity is there and we are all caught up in it. And so God comes and he wants to liberate, he wants to break that desire, that deep desire for that next circle by giving us this access into the circle that we were created for that is fellowship with God the Father and the Son and the Spirit and one another. And he does it through the person of Jesus who had to, uh, who had to uh, be rejected by the Father, who had to experience uh, uh, exilement from the Holy Trinity, from the inner circle there on the cross when the sin was on him, when the, the, the weight of, of our guilt and our shame was on his shoulders, condemnation, damnation, all of that. Jesus experienced so that we could be back, we could have access back into the inner circle. Now, how do we, how do we get into the inner, inner circle? The Bible says if we put all of our weight on Jesus, that is, that is the image of believing in Jesus, taking all of your soul's weight, all of your deep desires, your longings, your insecurities, everything, your, 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 your righteousness, putting it on Christ and trusting Jesus to fulfill you in all the spheres of your soul. And we put our faith, and the Bible says that we are then joined, we're baptized into, back into this inner circle. That is the body of Christ. Practically and tangibly, we are baptized into a community, the church, which is not only the body of Christ that gives us access into this holy trinity, but it is the bride itself, the, the second Eve. The Bible says one day Eve and the second Adam, the second Eve and the second Adam will have a wedding day, meaning Christ and his body, his church, will be united once and for all, and we will be naked and unashamed. We will be in this cosmic dance of, of oneness. That day will come. But the only way that reality becomes your reality is if we are baptized into the body of Christ, the church. And so what happens is, whenever we are, this is where the text is kicking in now, whenever we are retracting from the body of Christ, whenever we're pulling away, departing, we're neglecting the gatherings of the, of the, of the saints, we are parting from Christ himself. Can you accept that? When we are parting from Christ, when, we, when there is a withdrawal from the church, there is a, ret a withdrawal from Christ. There just is. You are, by default, withdrawing from his visible body, the church. Now, what causes us to draw away from Christ? 
sin, right? Sin causes us to draw away from Christ. Unconfessed sin, we're going to get to that in a, a moment. Sin that uh, intentions, desires, uh, things that you've done that uh, uh, people don't know about. And it causes us to depart from the church. Why? Because the only, the only version of us that can exist in the church is the true self, not the projected self. It's the self that is naked and unashamed. That is the only self that is able to exist in the community of, of God's people. And, and so when we are not confessing our sins, we are projecting false selves on each other. And so we are departing from the community. Unforgiveness. When we are holding grudges, we are departing from community. We are not able to be in fellowship. Fellowship is broken. It's shattered when there is unforgiveness. Love of money. The Bible says that many have wandered away from the faith. Listen, whenever someone wanders away from the faith, they also wander away from the community. They wander away from each other. They are pursuing material gains. They have found a different inner circle that they are after. Self-indulgence. Self-indulgence is a very practical sin that draws us away from the body of Christ, from God himself. Uh, it could be simple things as the segue could be uh, binging on Netflix. You can't show up to small group because you're binging on Netflix. Uh, you are uh, watching sports on Sunday so you can't attend. Or you're participating in sports. Your kids are participating in sports. And so you don't have margin in your schedule, practical margin, to be there with the gathering of the saints. You're gathered with different inner circles. Hobbies. Hiking. Nature. All good things. Some people say, I find God there. I do too. But God is found in community. This is the body of Christ, and we are called not to forsake the gathering of the saints for hikes. Thank you, brother. You probably don't like hikes. <laughs> vacations is another one, right? No hit on vacations. We got one coming up in April. But here's what I'll say. The norm used to be once or twice a year where someone would go on a little vacation or, or a large one, doesn't matter, once or twice a year, two Sundays a year, three Sundays tops, where someone is not able to be at the gathering or at the small groups. Now, I'm just being real, it's once or twice a month. Once or twice a month on an, any given Sunday, any given Sunday, we have over 100 of our members absent from the gatherings. 100 we have folks, I, I sometimes, I meet folks, I, I meet folks, and I'm like, hey, I've, I've, hey, how long have you been coming? I've been coming here for two years. Really? Whoa. I've, I've been at the front door for two years. I've never seen you. Right? And so what happens? We are living in this kind of culture. Friends, I'm, we're, hey, we're, we got to be practical right now. We, we got to be practical. We, we are a very affluent society. We have money. We have desires, we have opportunities. And so it is so easy for us to neglect the gatherings of the saints. So easy, so easy. Now, I don't have anything, there's nothing wrong with, you can go on vacation, you could be, uh, uh, you, you could be sick at home and we're gonna pray for you, but there's a difference when you are gone and you don't care about the gathering or, and when you are on vacation and you're like, man, I wish I was there. I couldn't make it to small group, but man, you're calling up, you're finding out how was small group? How did you guys, was there anybody new came up? Did you guys, was there any praise reports? Did you guys pray? Did you guys encourage? Did you guys prompt one another, right? Oh man, I wish I was there, right? That's called being there present in the spirit where you're praying for the church, you're praying for the gathering, you're praying for one another. You just wish you were there, but you can't because you're on vacation and that's okay, but, but, but not to, Make this a habit, the Bible says. Not to make this a habit where we forsake the gathering of the saints. The last thing that kills, the last thing that draws us away from community, this is the last one, the dream of an ideal community. All of us struggle with this one. We all have a ideal community in our head, ideal preaching, ideal worship singing, ideal song choice. Ideal, uh, the, way, the way we do prayer gatherings. An ideal culture, perhaps, language. 
service length. We all have an ideal community in our head. We just do. We do. But here's what, it, what happens. Do you know what the killer of real community is? It's the ideal community. What kills real community, the one that God has given you, the one that he's given me, is my obsession about the ideal community. Because if we all come together and we try to enforce the ideals on each other, we will all part ways. We'll just do it. We'll part ways. And so sin is what causes us to depart from Christ. It's what causes us to get into a habit where we are perhaps present physically, but emotionally, uh, emotionally and mentally, we are absent. We are checked out. We're checked out. We're not here. Hebrew chapter 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart and turns away from the living God. What are the false beliefs that you have? Address them because it, they will cause you to turn away from the living God. And, when I, and, and what that practically looks like, it simply looks like even drawing away from community, the body of Christ. So Paul says, let us not give up meeting together. The Greek word there is espinagi, from where we get our word synagogue. And it means a congregation, a formal gathering of people, a formal gathering of people. A congregation is different from an aggregation. An aggregation is an informal gathering. It's when a bunch of people gather together like marbles in a bag, and there's proximity, and there, there, there's friction. Uh, it could be a concert that, we've, that, that we're attending. It could be Seahawks that we're attending, right? We don't know these people. We don't care about them. We're there for the game. We're excited. We're going crazy. The game's over. You walk away. You never see that person again. That's called an aggregation. But a congregation is more of a, it's more like the cluster of grapes, where everyone has, uh, everyone is organically related to each other. We're together, and there is purpose for our, our, our gathering. We are all synced. We're all dependent on one another. That is the word uh, meeting together, congregation. Do not forsake this kind of gathering. You could forsake the aggregations, but do not forsake the congregation. Now, what is the function of a congregation? What is the function of the church? Uh, Jonathan Lehman, he defined the local church this way. A local church is a group of Christians who regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ and his kingdom through the gospel preaching and gospel ordinances. So we are a group of people that are commissioned by God to, uh, to reaffirm each other's uh, membership in the, in, in the body of Christ, in Christ himself. We keep each other accountable to make sure that we are rooted in the body of Christ that one day will be uh, married to him. That's our job. We are there to do that, and we do it through the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper communion, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. A different way to define the assembly is the assembly is the place where means of grace abound to God's people for sustaining their life of appropriate, grateful outworking of their salvation. So the gathering of the church is a means of, of grace to sustain us in our appropriate and grateful working out of our own salvation. We are here to help each other work out our own salvation. That's what we're here for. The function of the church is to steward God's grace so that we would continue being saved because there's three phases to salvation. You were saved, you are being saved, and then you will be saved. That's glorification. And it is the body of Christ that makes sure that we are all progressing through our journey of salvation. Are you guys with me? You take, you take yourself away from, your, from this body, you take away the means of grace. You just do. And so let's begin with what that practically looks like. How do we steward God's grace to one another? The proclamation of the word is the first one. This is the foundational, uh, 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 this is the pillar, the cornerstone that we, must, that we must practice, preaching the living word of Christ, preaching Christ. 
We are to pre preach Christ to one another. Today as I am preaching and there's someone sitting here today, let me just tell you something. That thing that's stirring in your heart, that is the spoken word that is permeating your heart and it's creating friction, it is creating life. It's being planted down deep in your soul and your will. That's what happens when you come on a Sunday and preach. You stop coming on a Sunday, you're not going to get that. You're just not going to get that. The, the word of God on the Bible is powerful, but listen, we have a tendency to, to read it through our own lens. We have a tendency to completely misinterpret the, the passage. We just do. And so it doesn't have the effect. It doesn't have the power to make us alive. What makes it alive is when someone takes that word and then speaks it into your life. Speaks it into your life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his classic book, Life Together, uh, he says, God has willed that we should seek him and find his living word in the witness of a brother, in the mouth of a man. Therefore, a Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. He needs him again and again when he becomes uncertain and discouraged. For by himself, he cannot help himself without belaying the truth, without downplaying or twisting the truth. He needs his brother man as a bearer and proclaimer of the divine word of salvation. He needs his brother to speak the word. There is more power. The word is more powerful on another's lip that is being spoken to you. There are moments where I get into a funk, even on Mondays, something I just get into funk. I, I'm in the habit of reading scripture. I open up my Bible. I'm reading my Bible, and I, I close the Bible. I pray, and I'm still in a funk. And I know that I need my brother in that moment. And so what I'll do sometimes is I'll call a brother. I'll call a friend. And I'll, I'll share what's happening in my soul. And then I will wait for the brother, if he is a godly brother or sister that, that sat under the sermon today, they will know you take the only thing that can give them life, that can encourage, you take the word of God and then you speak it to them. And I think it's even more powerful when we're doing it together uh, personally in, in proximity. Why? Because you get to practice the actual presence of Jesus Christ. Here's what I mean by that. I had someone, I had Mr. Colville stop by on Monday, Pastor Colville, uh, uh, and I was just in a funk, and I said, brother, I, I'm, I'm jumping into the sauna. It was like nine o'clock at night, and he's my neighbor, so he can just, he, he came over. We have this little sauna that I got at OfferUp, um, and he just, he came in, and I shared what was going on. He looked me into the eyes. You know, he does that. He looks me in the eyes, and he says, and he says, and he begins to speak God's truth into my life. And then he touches my shoulder and he begins to speak God's truth into my life. And then we walk out and he gives me a hug and embrace. And he says, my brother, you will be okay. God will not leave you nor he will, will, he will not forsake you. You keep seeking God. You will run and not grow weary. And I don't know what happened, man. I just, I was, I was rejuvenate, rejuvenate, re, uh, re, there you go. Come on. I was, I was galvanized, my brothers and sisters. Something happened. Something happened. Hey, it's my second service and it's spring forward. Come on, give me a break, right? Something happened. The living word of God uh, was spoken into me and it made me alive again. And so we need that. You don't show up to small groups, you're not gonna get that. You don't show up to the gatherings, you're not gonna go. You can come once a month. Hey, that's to your detriment. That's to your detriment. Now, the table fellowship. Uh, this is where we do life groups, right? Our small groups and where we practice even here on Sundays where we do communion once a month. Uh, this is where life happens. This is where life happens. The table is where his bread, meaning his body, becomes our body. Jesus offered his life, his body, to us as a sustenance, as life itself. Now, there's two aspects to that. Uh, justification, right? He offered, he offered the life that he lived that we could never live, and he attributed it to us. He, he gave it to us. It's been imputed to us. So when the Father looks at us, he sees the life of Jesus. There's that. But also, Jesus offered his way of life. He offered his character, his nature. He gave it to us. So when we are born again, we actually have the lifestyle of Jesus available to us. We could live it out. Jesus gave it to us. He did. And he also gave us his blood, which is uh, the sign of his covenant. He gave us his covenant, meaning I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you. I am with you. And, and, and to the end of the age, this is how this is going to play out. You can count on me. You can count on me. We are in covenant together. 
And so uh, that is offered through the communion. That is a great reminder that, of the gospel. Now, what does that practically uh, mean for us? When we get together in life groups, when we now become people around the table, we practice the way of Jesus and we too offer our bodies to one another. We offer our lives to one another. We give ourselves away uh, practically so that others can be sustained, so that others can flourish, so that others can live, experience the abundant life. The only way that's going to play out is when the church begins to give themselves up to one another. And we model in the way of Jesus, hey, till death do us part. You can count on me. I'm stepping into a covenant. That's what table fellowship is. We are in covenant. We're not just gathering together as a aggregation. No, no, we are a congregation. We are knitted together. We belong to one another. I'm not going anywhere. You can count on me. Now, in a culture that needs 200-page uh, uh, contract to, for uh, a cable bill, or a cable, a cable agreement, right? Meaning we live in a culture where no one keeps their word, where commitment is not a virtue, it's a vice. That is going to be hard for the church. We are going to, uh, we have false beliefs. We've been discipled by culture. How does this benefit you? If you show up to small group, how does it benefit you? If you show up to uh, the Sunday gathering, how is it gonna benefit you? How is it going to benefit your kids, right? That's our culture. That's the false belief that we've embraced. Yet the table fellowship is a completely different message. You come to give yourself away to the people. Anthem Church, you are not fully part of this community until you are in a life group. Did you know that? You are perhaps participating as an as a aggregation format where you kind of, it's like showing up to a Seahawks game. But there's, there's no ties. There's no commitment to people here. And so the Lord today is prompting you to be committed to one another behind a table where you are doing life with people for the next 30 years. Can you, can you do that? Can you say, for the next 30, 40 years, I will not be here? Did you know that it used to be the tradition of people where they would build their homes around the proximity of the church? As, as close as they could. Now, I know that w our times are different. We have highways and we do all that. But the idea was people wanted to be as close as possible to community where they are doing life, to the people that they are giving themselves away to. That is the gospel. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You want to fulfill the law of Christ? Bear one another's burdens. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, the Christian, however, must bear the burden of a brother. He must suffer and endure the brother. It is only when he is a burden that another person is really a brother and not merely an object to be manipulated. If there are people in this room, if there's no one that burdens you in this room, they are not your brothers and sisters. If you truly want to feel them as your brother and sister, bear their burden. Call them and ask them, how can you practically help them? How can you practically help them flourish? Uh, I'm going to move on. I had to erase a bunch of stuff uh, because I just ran out of time in the first service, so we're going to skip over some things. Uh, are, we are called, uh, thirdly, to provoke one another. So I talked about preaching the word, table fellowship, and now provoking one another. Uh, stimulating one another towards love and good works, the Bible calls us to do. Uh, th that is, uh, spur is the uh, word that the NIV uses, and it's the idea of tugging on the brittle of a horse, right? You, you're, go right, go left, go faster, right? Stop, stop. Uh, we are called to do that for one another. Why? Because we do not stumble our way into love. We do not stumble our way into love. Love is creative goodness. It's where we are doing good unto others with the right intention, with the right emotions. We are serving one another. We do not stumble our way into that. We need to be stimulated into that. Because sinfully, we always do what is most loving towards us, yet the Bible calls us to create a new habit because that is the innate, deep desire of a born-again believer is to love the brother and sister above themselves. 
And so we are to, to, to do that. Now, you guys know that you cannot love outside of community. You need community to exercise love. You need community for it to become practical. Let me give you a few examples of how we could provoke one another. Sister, I've noticed that after service, you only talk to uh, your circle of friends. You are not uh, hospitable, as the Bible calls us to be hospitable to strangers. Hey, you're, you're, in, a single, uh, uh, you're in a season of singleness. Paul in 2 Timothy uh, calls the single people to prioritize the Lord, to take this gift that God has given you and to uh, do as much as you can for the kingdom of God, for advancing your kingdom, not to travel every single weekend. The Bible, the Bible calls us to be, to be known as generous people. The Bible calls us to, to be contributors, to serve. Hey, my brother, you've been unemployed at this church for a very long time, meaning you are not, you are not contributing to the welfare of this church. You are not serving. You're not, you're not edifying the believers somehow. And so, look, that's awkward, right? And we're, for this to actually work for us, where it's not imposed on one another because imagine we walk around like hey man like you're only talking to people that are on your snapchat group like that would be awkward now in order now this is a command so in order for this to really work out for us here's what we need to do we knowing we have these sinful tendencies we know in whatever they are you fill in the blank whatever they are you come up to your friends come up to people that you trust people that are living or are in the same trajectory as you of discipleship you tell them hey when you see me doing this or doing that or not doing this and not doing that i'm asking you please for my own sanctification for my own sake would you please call me out would you would you would you uh stimulate me would you uh spur me would you would you would you provoke me? That's the language. Would you provoke me? When I begin to forsake the gatherings of the saints, it's not loving to do that because we're just not the same when you're gone. Would you begin to start calling me up and, and, and calling me out on that? Friends, that is the mark of a mature Christian when we can go and we can ask people to keep us accountable. It is countercultural because we are living in a culture that is obsessed with self. A culture that is all about, I do what I want. I'll spend my money how I want to spend my money. I'll spend my time how I, I I'll hang out with whoever I want to hang out with. You don't tell me what to do. Now, if that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. But you can't have community and that at the same time. You can't have the, the presence of God in your life and that kind of uh, uh, lifestyle. You cannot have that. You just can't have these, this dichotomy in your life. You just, it, God will not allow it. And so we are to call one another out towards love and good works. Confession is the fourth one. The Bible calls us to administer confession to, uh, 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 for one another. James 5.16, confess your sins uh, to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, the language of healing is the language where you don't, you don't have vigor. Uh, you're lethargic. There's no life in you. It's, it's when people were fasting and they were just, their face was downcast and they needed to get oil so that they could pretend, they could, they have, an, they could have an appearance of being jolly and being in a really uh, cheerful mood. And so the Bible says people who have unconfessed sin, people that are projecting false selves on the community, they, the reason why they're dead and lethargic, the reason why they grumble, the reason why they complain, the reason why they're forsaking the gatherings of the saints is because they have sin that is eating at their bones. David says, when I hid my sin from you, God, my bones began to decay. Folks, listen to me. Perhaps the reason why you cannot sing on a Sunday service in corporate unison is because you have sin in your life. Now, I know where you guys are coming from. You're coming from a culture, a church culture, where, where confession was misunderstood and abused. 
completely misunderstood and abused. It was used against the church until no one confessed sin. No one confessed sin. Everyone was forced to be in hiding. And the church produced dead Christianity. Christianity that has no zeal. Christianity that has no song. And the Bible says the way we find freedom is by confession. What is confession? Confession is when you find a brother and sister and you prosecute yourself. You find a ear and you say, I, would you give me five minutes? I want to prosecute my soul to you. Here's what I did. I did this, and I'll give you an example. I met up with uh, Brother Glenn, and I met up with Glenn, and I said, Glenn, I need to confess to you. And he said, what's going on? I said, hey, uh, two mornings ago, we were running late to school, and I already packed my son's snack, and I, we, we, it was time to get out of the car, uh, to get out of the, uh, the door into the car. I'm standing in the, uh, in, in, I'm standing, I'm sitting in the car, the kids are in the car, and my boy Ezra decides he wants to change the snack that I, that I got him. And so he goes upstairs, and we're already late, and he's going upstairs, and he's digging around for five minutes. And I repeated three times that we have to leave. There's no time to change out the snack. And I, and I said, hey, when, when I, I was feeling frustration because he was crossing my will, I just felt this frustration. And I felt God telling me, Alex, do not say anything. Do not say anything. And Glenn, you know what I did? I berated my boy. I looked him in the eyes. I said, how dare you disrespect me like that? And I spoke to him the way I should have never spoken to him. And I told Glenn, I said, the reason why I did this is because he crossed my will. I'm the father. I pick the snack. I, I decide when it's time to leave the house. I have this in me. And I, as I was doing that, I was crossing the father's will because he told me not to say anything. And so I was acting like a self-righteous hypocrite. And it was eating at me. Friends, as we become more mature and as we, as we practice confession, listen, we will begin to prosecute ourselves with the smallest sins because we want to be known. We want to be, we want to be our true self, naked and unashamed. We want to sing. We want to sing. And so we are called to confess our sins to one another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, it may be that the Christian, notwithstanding corporate worship, common prayer, and all their fellowships and service may still be left to their loneliness. The final break to fellowship does not occur because though they have fellowship with one another as believers and as devout people, they do not have fellowship as undevout sinners. You will never break out into true fellowship until you begin to confess your sins and begin to relate to one another as sinners that need God's grace. That will humble us. And we see this playing out in Paul's life. There's this journey of humility that he is on. Uh, 56 AD, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. Uh, 60 AD, he says, I'm the least of the saints. Uh, 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 64 AD, he says, I'm the chief of sinners. There is this progression where he realizes his depravity. And he wants to confess it publicly to the churches that he's ministering to. The power of confession. Some of us will say, well, I confess my sins to God in prayer. And here's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer will say to that. Why is it that, even, uh, why is it, that it is often easier for us to confess our sins to God than to a brother? God is holy and sinless. He is a just judge of evil and enemy of all disobedience. But a brother is, a, is as sinful as we are. He knows, he knows from his own experience the dark night of the secret sin. Why should we not find it easier to go to a brother than to a holy God? But if we do, if we find it easier to go to God, we must, we must ask ourselves whether we have not often de uh, been deceiving ourselves with our own confessions of sin to God. Whether we have not rather been confessing our sins to ourselves and also granting our ourselves absolution. If you are alone with your sin, you are utterly alone. You have not confessed your sin until you have spoken it to a brother that represents Christ in that moment. And Jesus tells to his disciples in John 20, 23, that when, that you, I'm giving you the right, I'm giving disciples the right to profess forgiveness towards one another. If someone comes and they confess their sins and they're repenting, they're, re, they're, they're turning to Jesus, they're repenting, you have the right 
Now, you're not the originator, uh, originator of this forgiveness, but you have the right as my steward of grace to profess it, to speak it into their life, to speak it into their existence. You, my brother and sister, are forgiven in Jesus' name. You're forgiven. Go and sin no more. Go and do not berate your son anymore. And that's exactly what Glenn did for me, and it was liberating. And so I want to close with this last point. It is the song of the church, the, the song of new fellowship. Have you ever wondered why we sing on Sundays? Have you ever desired for us to skip singing the, the, the segment on Sundays? Like, man, let's just do word, more word. Like, imagine if we had 15 minutes for a sermon or... What, what is it about singing? What is it about uh, the fact that some people prefer to just stand outside and skip, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, the singing uh, segment? Just, hey, we'll come in when songs, when the singing's over. Like, that's kind of for the extroverts. What is it? What, what, what is singing? What, 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 what does it do? What's, what's the intention? Did you know the Bible mentions singing over 400 times? And 50 of the times it's commanded. It is a command to sing. It is a command to sing. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. Sing, daughter Zion, shout out loud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has spoke, has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Never again. God's commanding them to sing. Zephaniah 3.17. He, this is God, is rejoicing over those that are saved with singing. Did you know that God is rejoicing over us with singing? God, you think you're tough? You think you're a man? You're not a man until you begin to sing. The way God sings rejoices over us with singing. God has established a song. And he's inviting all creation to join the song. It is the song that the morning stars sang together with the sons of God when they shouted in creation. It is the song of victory that the children of Israel sang when they crossed the Red Sea. It is the song that, that uh, Mary sang when, she, when the announcement was made to her that Jesus was coming. It was the song that Paul and Silas sang in prison when the gates were open. Friends, this is the song that we see sung in Revelation chapter 15, the song of fellowship, the song of the inner circle, the song of salvation. We are not truly united until we are united in the song. Are you guys hearing me? We are not truly united until we are all affected by the gospel in such a way where we want to sing together, sing together as one for all of eternity. And the Father joins us in the singing, and the Son joins us in the singing, and the Spirit joins us in the singing. And so I want to invite you to stand on your feet. John Wesley and his brother wrote over 6,500 hymns. And listen to what he says. He says, sing all, sing lustily with good courage, Beware of singing as if you were half dead and or half asleep on spring forward Sunday. But lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, no more ashamed of it being heard than when you sung the song of Coldplay, Satan. Are you guys hearing me? We, we could be in our cars, we'll turn on some kind of secular music and man, we're bumping, right? We're singing. We'll be at a Seahawks game, and we'll go crazy. We'll be chest bumping because, because so and so. DK, come on, one more. Let's go, one more. Let's go, right? And, and if you're not really into football, but because you were invested for three hours, you might be like, oh, that's so cool. Good job, guys. Who's DK? But if you're really invested, maybe in financially invested, dude, somebody scores a touchdown, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. And the, the Hebrews, uh, the, the, there's a Hebrew word for what we, what we do in that moment when we just lose our mind, when the Seahawks score. You know what it is? It's the word halal. And the definition is to boast foolishly, to make a show of it. It is commanded for us to, to be like this. It's to do it. 
but it only happens when the gospel permeates, when we become like Paul, chief of sinners. We get it. We get it. We're the least of the saints. We're the chief of sinners. We get it. And Christ, Christ has redeemed us. And now we are part of the song of fellowship, the song of the inner circle. Oh, come on, Jesus. Thank you. I know I'm going crazy. I'm going a little crazy here. But, but where is our song? Where's the song of salvation? Confess your sins if you have sin in your life. Carry each other burdens if life's too hard. Don't forsake the gatherings of the saints so that we would never stop singing the song of new fellowship, the song of salvation. We must sing the song. Did you know what the word hallelujah means? It's hallelujah, hallelujah. The, the Hebrew word for hallelujah is this, a shouting call, call for corporate praise. Did you guys know that? It is a command. It is a public call. Hallelujah! Come on, people! Hallelujah! No, you just start praising. That's what you start doing. Guys, we're, we're only scratching the surface. Church should not be boring. Sunday services should be exciting. Our kids should want to be here at the front row, stimulated by what's happening in the parents. Come on, we should have our youth restored, run and not grow weary. Why are we so old? Sin does that to us. We should be young like the Father. We should be dancing and singing and rejoicing like the Father. I know we came out of a very oppressed culture my friends but we are born again i know that your temperament doesn't allow it but good news for you you're born again you're born again i know naturally you can't do it good news for you the spirit of god is in you and you can supernaturally do it we are all leveled we're all in the same plane we can all sing the song in christ jesus and so let's sing the song my friends when will we sing the song together? Let me do one more quote because I'm late anyways. Listen to this. This is really important. Unison singing, difficult as it is, is less of a musical than a spiritual matter. Only where everybody in the group is, dis is disposed to an attitude of worship and discipline can unison singing, even though it may lack musically, give us the joy which is peculiar to it alone. The more we sing, the more joy we will de de derive from it. But above all, the more devotion and discipline and joy we put into our singing, the richer, will, uh, the richer will be the blessing that will come to the whole life of the fellowship from the singing together. It is the voice of the church that is heard in the singing together. Our worship team, all, many times they say it's so hard. It's so hard. Do you know why? Because there's people that are disrupting the fellowship disrupting the fellowship of the song, refusing, sinning against God, sinning against God. I'll say it again, sinning against God. And if you see somebody doing that, the Bible calls us to provoke them, to, either to the gospel if they're not saved, to confession, or to obedience and sing. Because God's doing something here. We're becoming a community, a community that's singing together a song of salvation until death do us part. Amen? Let's sing. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this moment, Lord. We bless you. God, we need your grace. Would you please allow us to sing now as we fixate our hearts on you, as we consider what you have done for us and what you are still doing for us. In Jesus' name. i yes. 
I was was trying to stimulate us there, if you didn't notice. I was trying to give you an example. And uh, we look at the older brother coming, and he's saying, what's with all this music? What's with all this celebration? What's with the waste? Why are we wasting our resources and wasting our time on this fella? The father says, we had to. We had to. Friends, we have to. So the Father says, this is our proper response to what Christ has done for us. He has brought us in. We were orphans and now we are sons and daughters. We are back in the inner circle and let us never depart from it. Amen? God bless you guys.